You have a mic on this, Danny? Sweet. I think so. Right, yeah. Let's just, let me just test it. So, hello? There we go. I recorded that same presentation yesterday. So we are good on that. Okay. So we, if we need to, we can use the mic there, the uh, mouse there. For now, just hit mute. Yep. 
so we're gonna start. Uh, for who does not know me, uh, I'm Dania Shakron. I'm one of the second years pulmonary and critical care fellows. Um, today we're gonna be talking about hemoptysis and the intensive care unit. Um, we um, we're gonna go over the definition of hemoptysis, especially massive hemoptysis, the epidemiology, the mortality risk score that's out in literature, vascular anatomy, etiologies, uh, diagnosis, management, and some take-home messages. So in general, massive hemoptysis is a large amount of expectorated blood or rapid rate of bleeding. The problem is there is no clear consensus in literature on the definition of what constitutes the quantity that constitutes massive hemoptysis. There have been reports of 100 cc, 200, 240, 500, 600. Um, but there's no general consensus. And just to give you an idea, all you need is more than 150, 200 cc of blood to flood your entire dead space. That's like your anatomic dead space um, volume. So it's really not a lot of volume is needed um, to flood the airways. Now, the, generally, now we accept a range between 100 cc per day up to more than 1,000 per day. Now, the problem on... Um, counting on quantity to, de to define massive hemoptysis is patients are really, they either um, underreport or exaggerate the volume all the time. And the mor morbidity and the mortality of massive hemoptysis um, actually depends. <laughs> I love how everyone is eating. <laughs> I don't know if you guys are actually listening, but everyone's eating. Um, anyways, um, the mortality and morbidity in patients with hemoptysis really does not only depend on the volume, but the rate of the bleeding and the, um, how much the patient is able to clear the airway and the extent and, and the severity of the underlying lung disease. So um, this is where the magnitude of effect of massive hemoptysis as a definition of massive hemoptysis came into play. And now they define it as the volume of expectorated blood that is life-threatening by virtue of airway obstruction, hypotension, or blood loss. So the clinical impact of the hemoptysis is what matters rather than the quantity itself. Um, some epidemiology and lung cancer patients, up to 20% of lung cancer patients will experience hemoptysis. Um, only 3% will be massive hemoptysis. The incidence of uh, massive hemoptysis and cystic fibrosis is usually annual incidence is 0.9 to 4.1%. Um, mortality wise, early, early reports and literature, they mentioned like mortality rate of above 70% of a bleeding that is greater than 600 ml in four hours, which is pretty high. Um, <clears throat> before they started using <clears throat> bronchial um, artery embolization, and if the patient was considered not a surgical candidate, then the mortality rate was considered to be above 75% if the bleeding is greater than 600 cc within 16 hours. Now, recently, with the uh, improved diagnostics and therapeutic modalities, the mortality rate, you can see that it dropped significantly, 6.5 to 38%, which is good. Um, there is a mortality risk score out there in, uh, in the literature. It was done by this group of French. It was a French group. It was published uh, in 2012 in a respiration journal. What they did is they studied more than, more than a thousand patients with hemoptysis, and they studied the factors that independently affect the uh, increased mortality. Um, so this is actually the score, and they gave one point to chronic alcoholism, two point to cancer or aspergillosis, um, one point to pulmonary artery involvement, one point of the chest x-ray involves more than two quadrants and two points for initial mechanical ventilation. Um, and this is actually the, um, they studied the in-hospital mortality. So you can see the score of zero, the in-hospital mortality was like 1%. Once you go up to the max score, which is seven, the in-hospital mortality goes up to 
uh, percent. I don't think we use that a lot, but it's a, like an interesting score to uh, keep in mind. Um, the vascular anatomy, there are two vascular circulations that supply the lungs, the pulmonary and the bronchial system. Um, the pulmonary system is the one that's responsible for, you know, that you're responsible for oxygenation and carbon dioxide excretion. It's, um, it carries the blood from the right ventricle across the highly vascular pulmonary capillary bed and returns it through the pulmonary veins to the left atrium. Um, one thing to keep in mind, the pulmonary system, as you are very well aware, it is a low pressure circuit. It's like between 15, 20 um, systolic and like 5, 10 uh, diastolic. The arteries usually follow the airway and form a capillary network around the alveoli. This is in contrast to the bronchial system. Now the bronchial system, it's the system that supplies blood to the larger airways, to the lymph node, the nerves and the vessels of the mediastinum. Um, it is more high pressure, it's the systemic pressure. And it comes from the upper portion of the descending thoracic aorta at the level of the T5 and T6 vertebra. The reason why I'm mentioning this is the next slide where the source of hemoptysis is usually 90%. It comes from the bronchial circulation. This is where someone came up with the bronchial artery embolization. 5% um, of the cases is from the pulmonary vessels. And the rest of the 5% is other stuff like um, ruptured aneurysms, um, aortobronchial fistulas, non-bronchial systemic circulation, like the intercostal arteries and all the rest. Uh, so this is something very important to keep in mind. Um, mechanism of decompensation, and this slide is courtesy to the IP fellow, Bianca. She used it in her, um, in her recent lecture about massive hemoptysis, but it's super, super important, so we're going to go over it. Uh, the mechanism of decompensation is not hemorrhagic shock. That's something very important to keep in mind. It's actually asphyxiation. So the first step that hemoptysis is going to lead to the um, decompensation is aspiration to the contralateral lung. And you're, you're going to see most of our management is going to target to prevent this, is aspiration to the contralateral lung, because that will lead to airway obstruction, hypoxemia due to impaired um, gas exchange, followed by respiratory failure. And respiratory failure is the reason why pa patients usually have compromised hemodynamics and death. Um, so we're going to go back to this slide every single time we talk about management and what to do to, uh, for massive hemoptysis patients. Uh, now, etiologies, etiologies of massive hemoptysis, they have evolved over time. Back in the 60s, it was mainly 90% of cases of massive hemoptysis were tuberculosis, bronchiectasis, and lung abscesses. Um, the same group that did that mortality risk score, they, did, um, they looked at etiologies of uh, massive hemopt or hemoptysis in general. This is a study that was done over 14 years, so they have like good um, history in there. It was published in 2012, as we said, and you can see that the etiology, number one, is still bronchiectasis, 20%. 18% um, is still cryptogenic, no one knows why. 17% is cancer. TB, whether it was active or sequela of like TB, it's still high. And then aspergillosis, pulmonary artery involvement, and other um, etiologies. Um, so these uh, two uh, coming slides are just list of etiologies. It's a lot, so we're not going to go over every single one of them. But Infectious is very, very high on the differential of why a patient is having massive hemoptysis. TB is still, it's still, it, over time, the, like, the incidence of TB causing massive hemoptysis has um, decreased. However, it's still very common, especially in China and in Africa. And it can cause um, a mass hemoptysis in general, either when it's active because of the cavitary or the non-cavitary disease, because it causes bronchial ulceration to the adjacent blood vessels, or it can be like from prior TB, TB because it can cause sequela like bronchiectasis or fungal infection from whatever the cavity for the TB was. Um, or like a calcified lymph node as well. 
Um, another thing to mention is fungal infections, especially aspergillomas. They're like um, very associated with hemoptysis as well. Um, neoplastic um, stuff lung cancer, uh, mainly centrally located tumors. Squamous cell carcinoma is very associated with um, massive hemoptysis. One thing that I found very interesting is that up to 80% of patients with massive hemoptysis due to cancer, they will have small sentinel uh, bleeding episodes a few weeks before this episode. So it's, it's very important to keep in mind because maybe we can catch them and manage them early when it's still small hemoptysis rather than like massive hemoptysis and it's more of an emergency. Uh, bronchiectasis is, of course, still very high, including cystic fibrosis, hematologic um, diseases, especially those are like post-procedural uh, mainly. Um, a lot of etiologies, we can go over them later, uh, but I wanted to mention that despite of all the advances in diagnosis and everything, 20% of the cases are still cryptogenic and we don't know why. Um, and mostly cryptogenic hemoptysis happens in smokers. So um, another thing on this slide I wanted to mention, you can see that category of vasculitis, collagen vascular diseases and everything that causes it. Um, but one thing I wanted to mention is alveolar hemorrhage by itself. We always say it causes hemoptysis, but it's less likely to cause massive hemoptysis because the alveolar space is too big and it can keep the blood in there. Um, so it's, um, alveolar hemorrhage usually presents with mild hemoptysis, infiltrates, like some hypoxia, anemia, but not mainly massive hemoptysis. Um, and as you can see, most of the causes um, from both tables, both slides, um, come from parenchymal lung disease rather than airways. Airways are usually like from the cancer and the bronchial. And that's important to keep in mind because it affects the uh, management options that we have that we'll be talking about later. Uh, when we talk about uh, diagnosis, um, history and physical are very important, though it sounds very basic, but um, history can give you an insight of the etiology. If, 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 if a patient comes in and you just ask a family member and they tell you we have like cancer on this side, you'll know what to do. Um, and physical exam, of course. Um, also stuff that are, makes sense is rule out lung pulmonary bleeding. Just don't mix up hematemesis with hemoptysis or any epistaxis. Basic blood work, uh, type of cross, blood cultures, ABG, uh, CBC, ABGs, um, co coax. These are like basic um, blood work. I wanted to mention bronchoscopy after those, but I decided to switch it around and mention imaging because after the first diagnostic thing, after history, physical exam, and the basic stuff is to actually get imaging. Um, and imaging can be in the form of a chest X-ray or a CT more preferably, of course. Chest X-ray, it's easily, easily available. Even like small walking clinics might have chest X-rays. Um, however, if you look at this um, table, chest X-rays are very variable and identifying the site of bleeding. It's between 33 and 82% in identifying the site of bleeding. And it can identify the cause of bleeding in 35% of the time. So it's not that great, but it's, it's a quick first step to do. Um, CT on the other side, um, it is as good as, FOB is fibro-optic bronchoscopy, is as good as bronchoscopy in identifying the site of bleeding. And you can see it's between 70 and 88.5%. And it's even more efficient than bronchoscopy in identifying the cause of the bleeding. Um, CT can identify the cause of bleeding in 60 to 77% of the time versus the bronchoscopy in only 2.5 to 8% of the time. And, um, and that's a really old study, but it still, it still stands true. Um, when they studied 40 cases of hemoptysis with normal bronchoscopy, they were able to see the, uh, the cause of the bleeding in almost 50% of the patients using a CT scan. So you can see that the CT scan can be way more important than bronchoscopy when we talk about diagnosis. Is that a or CTA? CTA, yeah, CTA. 
Um, and in, in patients not requiring um, bronchoscopy for airway management, you might want to think chest x-ray CT first before you go ahead and call IP and get a bronchoscopy or rush for a bronchoscopy. So now the bronchoscopy, as I, as I mentioned in that table, um, the most important role of bronchoscopy is to localize the bleeding site when we're talking about diagnostics. And it's, it, it, is, it can successfully localize the bleeding site in 93% of patients with uh, massive hemoptysis. But what I want to um, try to tell you in the diagnosis part is imaging should be in your mind before a bronchoscopy sometimes if you don't need the bronchoscopy for airway management. That's something I want you to remember. Uh, when we talk about management, first and foremost, if we go back to the mechanism of um, decompensation, the first thing you want to try to prevent is aspiration to the contralateral lung. So one is stabilization. And stabilization mainly involves protecting the non-bleeding um, lung, which is accompanied by, which is, uh, which means is turn the patient to the bleeding site so that the blood is isolated to the bleeding lung due to the gravity and the non-bleeding site remains intact and fully aerated. Reverse coagulopathy, of course, this is basic, and establishing an airway. Something very important to keep in mind is we need an ET tube that is a large lumen, anything between 8.5, 9. Not less than that, because otherwise you won't be able to do interventions if you need to. Um, once you intubate the vocal cords, um, the, um, if the patient is actively having, is bleeding out, the recommendation is once you intubate the vocal cords with a bronchoscope, um, introduce it to the uh, non-bleeding lung. And that's how you do main stem intubation. Um, Okay, double lumen ET tube. They're not recommended. I should have highlighted not, so you don't read like double lumen is recommended. It's not recommended. Um, and the reason behind that, I mean, it's nice in concept. It's a nice concept, but the practicality of it is not that great. Um, one, I don't know if any of you have placed that before. No. Dr. Gray, have you? Exactly. So. <laughs> It really needs to be placed by expert team. It takes time. They usually do it in the OR under anesthesia. Patient is stable. He's well monitored. So it's time consuming. It's placed by expert team. It gives you two wor small working channels. So sometimes, like you can't do, you can't advance a bronchoscope. You can't do much with it, um, and it's easily obstructed with blood um, and clots. So it's a nice concept, it's a nice idea, but it's not practical. So the recommendation is not to do a double lumen ET tube. In um, in management, bronchoscopy is important for direct visualization. If you go back to the etiologies, when we talked about the etiologies, most of the etiologies of um, hemoptysis come from the lung parenchyma rather than the airways. So that's very important to keep in mind when we decide to do a bronchoscopy, because sometimes you're going to go in and you're going to find like, okay, what am I, what, what am I finding? But um, the, the, the biggest role of bronchoscopy and airway management is when we have an endobronchial lesion or any, any endobronchial process, because it lets you um, visualize the process, localize the site of bleeding, clear the airway of blood to maintain adequate ventilation, which what, what happened in that patient that Damon had in 19, because the lesion was actually, the blood clots were in the trachea already, and the patient's saturation dropped to the tens or 15%. Um, and it lets you establish a clear vision of the bleeding site to enable implantation of bronchial blockers or other endo endobronchial techniques. Um, now, when we talk about endobronchial techniques, one thing that um, I wanted to review is bronchial blocking techniques. Um, in bronchial blocking techniques, and it, again, it's, it's important because you need to block to, to prevent the aspiration and contamination of the contralateral lung to keep like the ventilation going. And you also need to buy yourself some time to figure out what to do. So that's the, the concept of bronchial blocking techniques. It's like a, um, um, what do they call it? The Blakemore, a tamponade. 
but there are certain differences and we'll talk about those. The point of the, uh, the, the way those bronchial blocking techniques are, it's a long flex flexible catheter. It's inserted through the ET tube, but it has this three, um, uh, like the, that port. The number, number four is hooked up to the vent. Number one, you introduce the um, scope with it. And number two is where the um, bronchial block blockade goes in. Um, it has a lasso at the tip of it. So the bronchoscope can actually be hooked up to it. And then you introduce it, you like direct it through the bronchoscope into the, the, the site that you want to block. Um, it's prone to dislodgement. So usually you need to go into one of the main stems or even the bronchus intermedius to fit that in. It's just a temporizing measure. And it's, it's often, uh, often like in the first 48 to 72 hours of hemoptysis up till you figure something else. Um, if you keep it long enough, it has its own risks, post-obstructive atelectasis, pneumonia, compression, trauma. Um, other options are Fogarty catheters. Those can be introduced with the working channel of the scope. So you don't need to put it um, in a different port. Um, and the re now the reason, these are just like images of how they are introduced, just a balloon at the tip of it, and then you um, inflate it to uh, cause the tamponade. The problem with bronchial, I mean, it's again, it's a nice in concept, uh, but the few issues here. One is when the patient is bleeding, you might not be seeing anything. The airways are all flooded with blood, so you're not seeing anything. Um, Two, usually the recommendation is you want the blood, the bleeding to stop before you introduce this. So it's kind of defeats the purpose. It's like, why is this a tamponade, but I want the bleeding to stop before I introduce it. So usually when they use it as a patient with like, let's say um, cancer, they're bleeding from one side, they stop bleeding, you're, um, you're expecting them to bleed again, you put this, you tamponade it, and then you send them to IR, something like this. Uh, but yet again, you can argue like, why do I need to put this? I can just main stem them on the other side and protect the other mm -hmm. side. But this is an option, it's out there. People have used it. Uh, but keep in mind that it's, it's also not easy to use. Like you're gonna use the bronchoscope, put the lasso in it and then introduce it and the blood is coming your way. How successful is this? I don't know if Dr. Gray has any experience with it. You're calling me up. <laughs> <laughs> because you're the old, you're like intensive no, care. No, no. <laughs> No, no, I don't. I don't. Yeah, so it's, it's not. At this point, this person going through it's easier than the Exactly. So this is what I want. Like, yeah, this is exactly what I want to say. Like these are nice stuff. You keep them handy, but um, I don't know about the practicality, and we don't get enough experience with them at least in training. Um, rigid bronchoscopy. I am also mentioning it, but not as an intensive care doctor. You're not expected to do that. Um, maybe IP, yes. Um, it requires experience, it requires, it's time consuming to set up, but the good thing about it is it's gonna give you a good working channel um, and you can introduce um, different equipment um, through it. But yet again, this is just out there, but not for an intensivist. Endo endobronchial medical therapy is mainly for endobronchial diseases. If you're having um, any, um, like endobranchial lesions. An option is ice cold saline irrigation. Um, and this was a study done really a long time ago, 1980s. Um, they went, uh, they did like 12 patients with massive hemoptysis and those massive hemoptysis, they, they defined it as more than 600 CC within 24 hours. What they did is they irrigated the airway. It's like a lavage. Um, the saline is like four degrees. Uh, Celsius, um, and they gave between 300 and 750 cc. That's a lot to give as a lavage, but that's what they did. Um, and they gave them in 50 cc aliquots uh, using a rigid bronchoscopy. Hemostasis was achieved in all 12 of them. The only side effect was like some transient bradycardia and recurrent hemoptysis in two. We we do that. Um, we do this ice cold saline irrigation, but um, we don't give 750 cc right now. I think we just give like 100, 200 cc's. And we just wait for the hemostasis um, to be achieved. Um, other options are epinephrine and norepinephrine. That's you, uh, also used for endobronchial lesions. We, 
we use it a lot in the Bronx suite for um, like post procedural or for EBBX or TBBX. Um, there are many different doses and dilutions um, for epinephrine. The main issue is just monitor mm -hmm. for side effects, which is like a cardiac arrhythmia. So the recommendation is uh, you use lower concentrations, like one in 100,000 in 2 ml aliquots, um, not to exceed 0 0.6 and uh, cardiac monitoring. Um, and just be careful in patients who have any cardiac arrhythmia or CAD. Um, another um, endobronchial medical therapy that is reported in literature is topical hemostatic tamponade therapy. And I was talking about this with Dr. Um, Diaz. We don't have it here. That's just out there in literature. Apparently they use it in military when someone is shot or they wanna do something. So we don't use it, but it's out there just for you guys to know. Um, it's a hemostatic agent that um, agent used was oxidized regenerated cellulose. ORC. It's like sterile, it's like a knitted fabric. It swells into gelatinous mass and it aids in the formation of clot after it's been saturated with blood. Again, you might see it. I don't know where you're going to practice, but you might see it. Um, other options are thermal ablative, uh, ablative th uh, methods. And these are, again, mainly for airway tumors, tumor debulking. They're used a lot in the OR at the Bronx suite. Uh, what we, um, the biggest risk here is the risk of airway fire. So the supplemental oxygen should be dropped to less than 0, uh, 40%. Um, what we have are laser therapy, APC, and electrocautery. And, and to keep in mind, this is, this is a lecture that is supposed to be for intensive care doctors. This needs experience. So this is where, at this point, an, a more specialized person would be involved in um, in taking care of the massive hemoptysis. Laser therapy is usually the energy from the laser beam is absorbed by the tissue and converted to heat. Um, that's how it produces photocoagulation, vaporization, and necrosis. Um, APC it uses argon, it's the, the inert gas, and it's the, the medium for conduction of electricity. Um, that's APC here. The first one is laser. Um, and the endobronchial electrocautery is like just direct electrical energy applied to the tissue. Um, now, the most important management step is to <laughs> treat the whatever the cause is through a bronchial artery embolization. Now, this procedure, I think it was first um, reported in the 70s, 1970s. And since then, now we consider it as the first um, line of therapy for massive hemoptysis. They do um, cannulation through the femme artery cannulation, um, and then they go into the, selectively into the bronchial artery. Um, when they do that, um, the clues for the bronchial artery as a source of bleeding is active active extravasation, but it only happens in 10 to 15% of the time. So it's not that common that you're going to see active extravasation, but they have other clues. Um, and that includes bronchial artery hypertrophy, hypervascularity, aneurysm, AV malformations. And just keep in mind that 20% of the cases, they're not going to have any clue. They're not going to see anything. Um, they're going to see like a normal bronchial artery. They use different agents in doing this. And each one of them, it's like depending on the uh, place. Um, and the success rate for bronchial uh, artery embolization is good, 60 to 90%. Um, here is a, it was a recent study, 2015, and they looked at the bronchial artery embolization outcomes. Um, they studied 52 patients. The immediate success rate was 92%. But they did notice that if a recurrence is going to happen, it's more likely to happen with TB, bronchiectasis, aspergilloma, and bronchogenic carcinoma. Um, complications are usually mostly self-limiting chest pain, self-limiting um, dysphagia. If there's like um, um, embolization, like non-target embolization of the esophagus or a transverse myelitis, if they embolize the spinal artery um, or like more rare stuff, cortical blindness, tracheospagia fistula, bronchial, uh, bronchial stenosis. So these are pretty serious, but at the same time, this is a life-saving procedure. Um, now, surgical intervention. Back in the 1990s, before like the bronchial artery embolization was so common, um, massive hemoptysis by itself was an indication for a thoracotomy. 
Now things have changed. Um, and one of the main reasons, and this is a very interesting uh, study that was done in 2009, and it was uh, published in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery. They looked at um, 11, um, yeah, 111 patients um, that required lung resection for severe hemoptysis. And they categorized them into three groups. Patients who got emergency surgical lung resection, patients who got scheduled surgical lung resection and planned um, surgical lung resection. Planned as in like they went home, they came back and they did it as an outpatient. And you can see the in-hospital, that last part, the in-hospital mortality, you can see how it, um, how it increased for a 17% with <clears throat> no, 35% with the emergency surgical lung resection, 4% with the scheduled and zero with the plan. Now the recommendation is try to avoid it unless it's absolutely necessary to do a surgery. Now it's still considered the procedure of choice an iatrogenic PA rupture because there's not, not much that we can do. Um, chest trauma, leaking aortic aneurysm, selected cases of AV malformations, and aspergilloma that's resistant to other therapeutic options. Um, the factors associated with adverse surgical outcomes are advanced age, pneumonectomy, pleural adhesions, bronchiectasis, and bronchiolithiasis. So the reason I, why, I mentioned, why I put this slide is because it comes up a lot, especially in our ICU. Is there a role for um, inhaled TXA and hemoptysis? So TXA is a lysine derivative that blocks lysine binding sites on the plasminogen and thus inhibits fibrinolysis. Um, there are multiple, multiple case reports out there about using inhaled TXA and um, how successful they are with it. But there's only one randomized control uh, trial, and this is was published in 2018 in CHEST. Um, they looked at 47 patients um, with hemoptysis with different etiologies. Um, what, one thing I wanted to show you, and that's why I added this table, is this part. They actually um, excluded all massive hemoptysis. Um, anyone who was hemodynamically unstable, anyone who had respiratory instability, everyone was excluded. So this was more for the mild, moderate. They used TXA 500. Um, mg per 5 ml three times daily. And they had good outcomes. If you see at the primary outcomes and the secondary outcomes, they had good outcomes. Resolution of bleeding was achieved during the first five days of admission in 96% of patients receiving TXA and 50% receiving placebo. TXA was associated with significantly reduced amount of expectorated blood starting from day two. And the secondary outcomes are also good. It's an improvement in like fewer interventional procedures, better um, length of stay, hospital length of stay, and uh, less rate of recurrence. So, but again, this is for mild, moderate, rather than for severe. It doesn't mean that, like, it's, this, the study doesn't say absolutely it doesn't work, it's just they excluded in this uh, randomized control trial. Right? Um, so this is a, okay, I needed less time. Where's uh, Hashmi? I needed less time than I expected, okay. Um, but this is a very um, nice um, uh, algorithm. So massive hemoptysis, do we have a, no. um, and it can cause acute respiratory failure versus no acute respiratory failure. But you can see both of them is admitted to the ICU. Um, and then they have a hemoptysis ABC, which is down in that table, hemoptysis ABC, which is bleeding side down, um, intubation, with a large lumen ET, ET tube, um, contralateral isolation and single lung ventilation, volume resuscitation, and then the part where you call for help and you got, get multidisciplinary team, IR, IP, surgery, anesthesiology. So these are the hemoptysis ABCs. And what Dr. Diaz wanted me to focus on is that those hemoptysis ABCs, every single ICU doctor should be able to do them, um, should be able to handle the airway before calling for help. Um, and then, then comes the role of flexible bronchoscopy. Um, you send them, and, and and depending on where the lesion is, um, endoluminal region versus no endoluminal lesion, you can see it here. 
Um, that's where you start using the cold saline, the thermal ablative methods, the tamponade, and then you go down. If it doesn't work, then you get bronchial um, artery embolization. If it doesn't work, you send them for surgery. Um, whenever you have time, it's actually a nice algorithm to um, follow. Uh, so my take home messages are time is alveoli. Uh, so every second lost, it means that the alveoli are gonna be flooded with blood. Um, systemic approach is key to timely control and reversal of fatal complications. Um, and manage the airway and then call for help. I wanted to change this last point is manage the airway and then call for help. Um, and the help is gonna be IP, IR and thoracic surgery. Uh, so doc, these are my, uh, Dr. Diaz um, helped me with this uh, presentation. These are my references and thank you. Any questions? I gave you guys 15 extra minutes for food and tea.